this morning, I just want to begin by setting up the context uh, of this passage. And essentially what I'm saying by that is I just want to kind of paint a picture of the situation, the circumstances, the people involved that uh, the author of Hebrews is speaking to. Um, this morning, as you open your text up, the author of Hebrews is writing to a group of Jewish believers, people who have left Judaism, people who have left that religion to follow Jesus into Christianity. And I want to talk to you all this morning in context as to the struggles that these people are facing because they've chosen to follow Jesus, because they've chosen to leave Judaism. I want to talk to you about their, their struggles that they're going through. See, Judaism is more than just a religion. All right? It encompasses the identity of a Jew. So that their family members, all through history, everyone is connected by this Judaism. So that every sacrifice, every holiday that's observed, every festival that's observed, is done so with the highest regard because they honor this tradition, they honor this religion so greatly. It's, it's really a part of who they are. It's like an anchor that ties them down, not just in the present, but it ties them to their history, to their roots, Judaism. And so for people, for Jews to have left Judaism to follow Jesus is no small thing, right? For them, it meant that they would have to disconnect themselves from the traditions that they, so, they grew up on and that they, they loved to do with their family members, for them, it meant that their family members would, would essentially disown them because they chose to follow Jesus. For them, it meant that they would be persecuted by fellow brothers and sisters because they chose Jesus. So they had to flee homes. They had to start over again because they chose Jesus. These are the people and the circumstances that the author is writing to this morning. For some of these Jews, it was such a struggle for them to leave the faith that they actually were practicing parts of Judaism as they followed Jesus. And it actually became this, this, uh, this new faith that they built, uh, combining the two, a kind of a hybrid faith. I want to, to invite you guys to enter into their lives this morning as you think about this text. And keep yourselves there. As the author is writing these words out, and as we go through 13 through 20, I want you to enter into their lives and imagine what it would have been like for, for them in the struggles that they went through because they followed Jesus. And honestly, it really isn't so hard for us to identify with them, right? I mean, haven't you felt a struggle because you've chosen to follow Christ? Haven't, hasn't there been, been more than one occasion where because you chose to follow Jesus, you've struggled in the decisions that you've made. You've, you may be the family members you hang out with, maybe your coworkers, maybe they've placed at such a, dis, such a level of discomfort for you that you struggle to say, I follow Christ. The waves, the currents of this world push us away and, and really try hard to keep us from following Jesus. As you guys know, uh, Seclalia is gonna be going on a mission trip in the next few weeks to Thailand. And I'm going, and I, I'm sorry, I'm not going. I went through the same program, let's just say a very long time ago. And I went to Nepal. And as I think about that trip, I remember a lot of the lessons God taught me. And one lesson was this, and it's an experience I want to share with you. So when we did the trip to Nepal, what we did was we trekked mountains. Essentially, we were going through the Himalayan uh, areas and going up and down steep inclines, and essentially there was moments where we would walk through a narrow pathway, and right to the right of us, just a few feet away, was a gigantic cliff, so the slightest slip in your history. There was a moment on this trip, towards the end, when we were trekking. We would trek for eight hours out of a day. I came back and looked like a skeleton. I was it's just, you know, sometimes I think if I need to lose weight, I just need to go back on that trip, but too expensive. Uh, so as we were walking along this journey, there was a body of water that was just flowing with a, just a ginormous amount of speed and current. And in order to get to the other side of that body of water, you had to cross this narrow plank. That's the only way to get across. So I'm at the end of the line. I'm, I'm last. And 
everyone has gone right in front of me just fine. You know, they, they made it look so easy. But as I get closer and closer to that body of water, I began to just stare down at the water because it was so loud. It would, the current was moving so fast. And I just knew that if I had taken a step on that plank, that I was going to fall into that water. I could get hurt or much worse. Thankfully, the missionary leader saw the fear and the hesitation inside of me, and he comes to me halfway uh, from the plank, and he, and he reaches out his hand and he tells me, just look at me, don't look at the water. Look at me, don't look at the water. And so that's what I did. I held onto his hand, I just looked at him, and I crossed the water. I was, yeah, crossed the water. And essentially, that's what I think this is as we get into this text this morning, is that we, you and I, are constantly being bombarded by currents from this world, trying to sway us away from walking with Jesus. It could be finances, it could be temptations, it could be friends, people, whatever, but there is a massive onslaught of current going just right in front of you, keeping you from walking in your faith with Christ. When all that Jesus is trying to do is stretch out his hand and asking you to look at him, he'll take you to the other side. Look at me. Ignore the voices. Ignore the, the current that's in front of you. Look at me and I will take you to the other side. You can trust me. And I really believe that's what we're about to find out as we enter into this text this morning. And that's, that's the image that just came to my mind when I was thinking about that, is the importance of us to, to look at Christ, even though we're in the midst of a current that's trying to sway us away from him. Uh, let's look at our passage this morning. Without reading again verses 13 to 17, I just want to begin by telling you what the author does. The author begins this sort of encouragement by drawing the attention of the Jewish Christians to Abraham. If you don't know this, Abraham is the father of the Jews. He is the most important figurehead or the man of Jew, just the Jewish history, because Abraham, essentially through him, becomes Israel. And in verse 14, the author references a specific verse out of Genesis chapter 22. It's a promise that God makes to Abraham. And he says this, I will surely bless you and I will multiply you. The Bible tells us that Abraham received this promise. He believed on it and he followed God all the way to the end of his life on earth. I want you to know one thing. When God promised to Abraham that I will bless you, that I will multiply you, he had no children. He was 75 years old. And it wasn't until he was 100 years old that God blessed him with a son named Isaac. 7,500. 25 years have passed. And I want you to know, if you haven't read through the book of Genesis, that in those 25 years of Abraham's life, he faced so much tension in that his nephew Lot parts ways with him. His wife Sarah was creating all sorts of chaos and turmoil, and there was a lot of tension just from her. And not to mention that each and every place that Abraham went to, who was being threatened or there was enemies that were looking to, to harm him, there was famines in the land. Essentially because Abraham chose to believe in God, there was all sorts of chaos and problems that came into his life. Problems that he probably wouldn't have faced if he said no to God to begin with. And you know, Abraham had no other guarantee that God was going to honor his promise. It wasn't like God, you know, set some sort of timer and said within this time it's going to happen. Or, or you know, it wasn't as if God had given some sort of extra incentive, God just simply promised to Abraham, this is going to happen, and Abraham believed it. As we read in verse 16, through it all, Abraham patiently waited before God honored him with that promise. Somehow, Abraham had a glimpse of who God was. He knew who made the promise, and he believed. He knew that God would fulfill the promise at any cost. He realized God is worthy of his trust, and not just a passive trust, but an active trust that led him to walk from his home to a place that was unknown to him, going through all sorts of misery, turmoil, and 
mess in order to trust who God was and what he promised him. And so this is the scenario, the, the situation that the author in Hebrews brings up to the Jews, Jewish believers. And in so doing, as soon as he drops the word Abraham, their ears are perking up because this is the father. This is the ultimate father of Judaism, the father of the Jews. And so the author connects their experience with who Abraham is. He's beginning to tell them, look, these experiences that you're going through are much like the experiences that you went through, your, your, your forefather went through, Abraham. And in addition to that, he's beginning to connect them with the promise that God made to Abraham. In verse 17, it says, he calls them heirs of this promise. So not only are you connecting the people with Abraham, but now the author is connecting them to the very promise that God made to Abraham. So the very promise that Abraham received is now the very promise they have in their hands. They are heirs of the promise. How does that work? How does it work? A promise can go from thousands and thousands of years, and how can it go from generation to generation to generation? Remember the promises in verse 14. It says, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. You know, what is this promise? And without Jesus, we would be at a loss to try to understand this, all right? When Israel first learned of this promise, this is what they thought. They thought that their nation was going to be a mighty nation, that their, their nation was going to be set apart in such a way that they would be the most prominent and most powerful nation on the earth. When they heard those words, they really believed that that nation of Israel was going to be great in strength, power, and number. But as you look through history, that wasn't the case. More than once, Israel was overtaken by nation after nation. But through Christ, we understand that God wasn't looking to set up Israel to be this mighty nation on the earth. He wasn't thinking about it in terms of earthly blessings or an earthly kingdom. God was driven with passion to build an eternal kingdom. When God made that promise to Abraham, he had eternity in his mind. I will surely bless you and I will multiply you, not on the earth, but in heaven for eternity. And only through Jesus do we come to realize that that is the promise. And in Genesis, it says that many nations on the earth, many other nations aside from Israel, will be blessed through Abraham. Well, it's because of Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection, all those who place their faith in him are now among the children of God. They are among the kingdom of God. So this promise was meant for eternity. And we all know Jesus comes in the lineage of Abraham. If you open up Matthew chapter 1, you don't have to now. But the genealogy of Christ begins with who? Abraham. And so when God makes that promise... Again, he has eternity in mind. I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. So when the author utters these words to these despairing Jewish Christians, these individuals who have left their homes, who have been persecuted, who have been mocked, who have been basically disconnected and disowned by their own community, when he's penning these words, he wants them to understand that one, you're at, you're forefather can identify with what you went through, but more importantly, the very promise that God made to him is yours now. The promise that I will bless and multiply you is now in your hands. You are the heirs of this most special, most sacred promise. And with that, the author is hoping to instill in them a zeal, a vision, an understanding that they are now called to bring what this promise is to the people who don't yet know or understand this promise, Jesus. He's wanting to inspire them to understand if you would remain steadfast as Abraham did, you will realize the blessing of this promise. I will surely bless and multiply you. 
the Jesus that's inside of you, God intends to use that to touch many of the unsaved around you. That promise still remains today. And that's what the author is trying to convey to the early Jewish believers. What about to us? 2013, May the 19th. There aren't many things that stand the test of time. You can look throughout history, kingdom after kingdom, people after people. There is none that can stand the test of time. But the scriptures tell us God's word will stand the test of time. God's promise, in this case, will stand the test of time. And this promise doesn't just remain with the Jews, but now you and I are heirs of this very promise that God made to Abraham so long ago. The promise that he is going to surely multiply us and bless us, again, not on the earth, but through us into the kingdom of God. In other words, God wants to rescue the souls of men and women through your life. God wants to rescue the souls of men and women through your life. And it's in that manner that he chooses to bless you and chooses to multiply you so that ultimately through your life, the kingdom of God is expanded. And it all happens because we are heirs of this promise. But both you and I, we struggle to accept this as a reality. Sharing Jesus to the world, we want to leave it to someone who is more qualified. Someone like Sam, or someone who's got a theology degree. We want to leave it to someone else, the certain group of people who are those Bible-bearing Christians who want to go out and share the gospel. We want to live, leave it to that group of people. But if you look back in the scripture, the only criteria on that really matters is this, is that you are heirs of the promise. And for all of us who are in Christ Jesus, we are all heirs of the promise. Therefore, we are all called upon to share the news of Jesus to the people around us. I want to challenge you this morning to really look at this, this specific promise. I want to challenge you this morning to really think about how you can apply what this means to us. How can you be blessed of God, multiplied, in order to spread, just spread the gospel to the people around you? I want you to make tangible goals. I would challenge you to think about a way how you can share the gospel to at least one person this upcoming week. I mean, we mention that here from this stage many times. We pray about it many times. But I would really ask you to, to seriously consider what you can do to try to share the gospel, whether it be a stranger or someone you know. What can you do to make this promise a reality in your life? I would encourage you to pray. Consider all the people in your life. Maybe you go through Facebook and some of you guys have got like thousands and thousands of friends. You know, I've got like something, I don't know. But Check upon them, and maybe there are people in your life that are unsaved. Pray over them. Pray that God would set up an opportunity for you to share the gospel with them. Your family members, your friends, whoever it might be, pray. God made the promise. It's His promise. It's up to us to be confident together in seeing Him fulfill that promise through us. God made the promise but it's up to us to be confident together in seeing him fulfill that promise through us. Turn to verse 17, chapter 6. I'm just going to read the first part. It reads, In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose. The unchangeableness of his purpose. I'm sure you guys have done this too. When I was younger, when I really wanted my friends to believe me, when I really wanted to get a point across, I would say, I swear. I swear to God. I swear on my mom's life. You know, whatever. I would swear to some higher being in order to get my point across. And then these were the moments that 
saying I promise wasn't enough. I mean, this was a, a whole new ball game. To simply say, oh, I promise just wasn't going to cut it. And so there are those rare moments as a kid when you're growing up that you, you, you were building up with intensity, the, 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 the drama is kicking in. You really want your friends to believe you. So you pull out that I swear card and you say, I swear on my mama's life that I ate a booger today or something like that, you know? You, you want to get it across so that the people who hear it will believe you. They who hear it will know that you mean business. As I've gotten older, I don't have to say that anymore, right? Or as you've gotten older, I hope you don't have to, you don't have to say that as well. Um, nowadays, you just simply say it, people believe you. Because they base it on your reputation as a man or as a woman. They know who you are as a person, hopefully a person of integrity. And so when you say something, they believe it. They take it at face value because they know you and your reputation, your reputation backs it up. Well, as you look through this passage, when the author is trying to convey to the Jewish Christians about the, the way God kind of promised this thing to Abraham about multiply, blessing him and multiplying him, he essentially does all three things. One, he is God. So his reputation is of, he's God. So his reputation precedes him. He is God. He says it. It's going to happen. But we also read that he made a promise to Abraham. He promises to Abraham that this is going to happen. And in verse 18, we find out that he takes an oath. He makes an oath before Abraham. It's his reputation. He makes a promise. He takes an oath. Remember when I told you that I would say, I swear, in order to really convey with conviction the, the desire in me to really go to that I swear card, to, pull, to make a point, to really convince my listener, this is what I believe, this is truth. Well, I really believe in the same sense, God is pulling out all three things because he wants those who hear it to understand the level of conviction that he has when he says that I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. It's to convey to Abraham, it's to convey to everyone who would listen, look, this is how badly I want you to get it. I am God, I, you know I can't lie, but I'm willing to promise to you. I'm willing to take an oath so that you know that this is business. And we read that it's because he has this unchangeable purpose. God, in promising this to Abraham, beyond this has a purpose, an unchangeable purpose. And the author of this book is trying so hard to convey this to the Jewish Christians that, that they understand that they get behind this purpose of God. You notice with me that the author isn't telling them to get to a safe house. He isn't telling them to prepare weapons or retaliate against their attackers. He isn't telling them to, to relent and just give up on their faith. But he's telling them to get under or get behind this unchangeable purpose that God has for them. And what is that purpose? You know, he refers to Jesus further on in this passage, a little bit later on. But if you want to understand the purpose of God you need to look no further than Jesus Christ. If you want to understand the purpose of God, look at Jesus. Because he once said, I and my Father are one. So when you see Jesus, you are seeing God. And once Jesus said that I came to this earth to seek and save the lost. So the purpose of God is to save the lost. And this is the purpose that the Jewish author is trying to get the Jewish Christians to fall behind. But what about you and I? You know, we often ask ourselves this question, whether it be in middle school or high school, what is my purpose? Why am I here? Why, what am I supposed to do? And as you get into college, you begin to think about majors and career paths. And as you get a little bit older, you think about marriage. You know, where does this all lead and I want you to know that that question does not end after you get a degree or after you get a job or after you're married. None of that 
ends. You will continually ask this question as you get older. Where is this all leading? What is my purpose? And I want to ask you this question. What would it look like if you, in some way, aligned your purpose, that, or, or at, least, at least answered that question with the unchangeable purpose of God? What would it look like if you're a college student and you're beginning to wonder about your major and your career path, that you would answer your question by connecting it with the unchangeable purpose of God, which is to save lost souls? How could you pattern your career, your, your vision for your life, so that you are looking to be a messenger or, or a, a person who will fulfill this purpose that God has? this unchangeable purpose that won't stop, it won't change as you get older, but it just remains the same. Or maybe you're married, or maybe you have a lot of kids. What would it look like for you to answer that question? How can I connect where I'm at in my life with the unchangeable purpose of God, of rescuing the souls of men and women? What would it look like? I shared this story aloft a few years ago. Um, so if you've heard it before, I apologize. Although I don't think a lot of you have heard it. Um, but a few, well, not a few. Back when I was in college, it's like, gosh, 17 years ago maybe, um, I was in the midst of making a decision about my major. And, you know, I entered into college with the desire to become a pharmacist. You know, my parents really wanted it. And, you know, I didn't know what else to do, so pharmacy was the way I went. Um, but as I went into college, as I entered in, I began to get involved with ministry, my relationship with Christ uh, became alive. You know, up until then, I would classify it as a robot. Uh, did the church thing, did all I was supposed to do because I was supposed to do it. But it was when I was in college that I really became alive in Christ, and His love became alive to me. So in my years in college, I changed my major. You know, I went into psychology. I chose counseling. Um, and again, this created a lot of drama uh, in my family. My parents were totally against me. Uh, we had a lot of shout. My dad and I had a lot of shouting matches um, in that time. They were dead set against me. And although they finally gave me their vote of approval, they did it begrudgingly. They, they did it not very happy. All right. Um, so I graduated uh, from college in 2002. And oh, I guess it wasn't 17 years. I think I blew that out of proportion. I'm not as old as I thought it was. I learned something new. Um, so I graduated college in 02, and I was looking for a job in the mental health field. 18 months passed before I finally landed a job. I had applied, I'd interviewed different places, but no one would hire me. 18 months had passed from the time I graduated till I got a job. And that job, I worked with folks who were uh, mentally retarded. And it wasn't the job that I was looking at when I got out or when I was choosing counseling as my degree. It, you know, it wasn't, you know, I was looking at maybe doing counseling work. And my intention was to really disciple folks, to really, uh, as a, as from a Christian perspective, you know, offer counseling to, to people. I mean, that was my call. That was what I felt God called me to do. It was my in attempt at matching my purpose with his unchangeable purpose. Well, that didn't happen. What happened was, is I got a job working with people who had mental retardation. It was my only way to get into the field, so I took it. But I honestly loved that job. I really did. I, I really loved it so much. I loved the people I worked with. I loved the clients I worked for. And many, I remember even now, there were nights where they would shut the clinic down, and I would stay in a dark building just simply praying for them, praying for my clients, praying for my coworkers, and it was just such a, just an intimate moment with me and the Lord, so grateful to God for the opportunity that he gave me. And two or three months later, we get the notice that the clinic is shutting down. Everyone who was employed by that clinic was being laid off. There was nothing to be done. It was shutting down. The end of story. And I remember asking myself and asking God, why, why did you do this to me? Why did you call me out of you know, this field and into this field and, and only to see me get laid off. Why did you do this to me, God? What are my parents going to think about me? The ones who 
were dead set against me following this career path. And somewhere, somewhere, sometime after that, an opportunity opened up for me to get interviewed working for a child and family counseling department. Um, it was a job I'd always wanted, working with kids, working with their parents. I had applied for it before and I'd gotten turned down. But somehow, by God's grace, I was accepted so that I was able to join this company right before I was, or right as I was being laid off. But as I got that phone call one day from the employer who hired me, I was at my old job. I got the word that I'm being accepted. You know, you're going to get it to come in and join us on this date. I hung it up. I was with such great excitement, I picked up the phone again and I called my dad to let him know what had happened. And like I told you, I worked with clients who are mentally retarded. There was one woman who came up to my desk, and she could barely speak. She can't read. Um, you know, she, she, she's really low functioning. She reaches into her pocket and takes out a crumpled piece of paper, and she just kind of throws it on my desk and walks off. And as I'm talking to my dad, I open up this piece of paper, and there's a scripture there. And it says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And it's actually out of Hebrews 13. It says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And it's in that moment that I understood that for all of us who would choose to link their lives with the unchanging purpose of God, this purpose of rescuing souls, this purpose of bringing the good news of Jesus, he will take care of you. He will provide. He will, he, and he is with you more importantly than taking care of you, more importantly than providing for you. To me, just to know that I wasn't alone in the midst of that most horrific experience spoke volumes. And again, this woman didn't know what I was going through. She could barely talk or understand anything. It was nothing but a piece of trash to her. But to me, it was treasure, and I still have it to this day because it reminds me of his presence, and it reminds me that his purpose is unchanging. Um, so I want to challenge you this morning to think about your life and about your career path and ask yourself, what can I do to link myself to this unchanging purpose of God? Uh, just the last point I want to bring out is in verse uh, 19 and 20 out of Hebrews chapter 6. Um, this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls it leads us through this, the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Jesus has already gone in there for us. He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Um, so again, we establish the fact that God made the promise. God upholds the promise because he has an unchanging purpose behind it. And ultimately, God fulfills the promise that he made to Abraham through Jesus Christ. And I just want to mention this one thing and then we'll be done because I know we're running a little sh short on time. But this is the thing I want to say is that in seeing what Jesus did in coming to the earth, in dying for us, we get a glimpse, not just a glimpse, we get an accurate understanding of the passion of God behind his promise. His desire to rescue the souls of men and women drove him to the point of releasing his son, his one and only son, not just to live among us and be among sinners, which is bad enough as it is, but he ultimately put him in a position where he was to die the death of every sinner, of you and of me. Jesus Christ endured our punishment, our sin on the cross. And he does that because God is passionately concerned about upholding the promise that he made to Abraham, this promise to rescue the souls of men. You know, little did Abraham know that day when God made that promise that it meant that his own son was going to die on a cross. And I, and I find it interesting that in order for God to uphold the promise, you know, Abraham was at a point of slaying his own son, but God stopped him. But in order to uphold the promise that he made, God freely released his son to be killed on a cross. Isn't it interesting? God spares the son of Abraham, but God doesn't spare his own son. 
in order to uphold the same promise that he made. That's the amazing truth and the power of the gospel. This morning, the author of Hebrews wants these Jewish Christians to know Jesus in such a more intimate way so that they would understand that it was God's passion that drove him to the cross. It was God's passion that essentially tore the veil that was separating all of mankind from his most beautiful presence. And essentially, he wants these Jewish Christians to know how passionate God is about them so that they are consumed with the love of God because he knows that unless they understand how much God loves them, anything and everything they try to do would be empty. Their attempts at trying to withstand persecution or their their attempts to keep the faith would be empty. But he wants them to get a glimpse, an understanding of how much, how passionately God loved them. And this morning, I want you to understand that You know, your attempts at serving God would be great and awesome. It's good. But it's all empty unless you understand how passionately God loves you. You know, until you look at the cross and you understand that, you know, it wasn't just merely because he had to do it, because it was God's passion that drove his son there. God's passion for you. And so this morning, in a moment, we're going to be taking communion And as you hold that bread and as you hold that cup, I really want you not just to think about the cross, and and of course we we reflect on the cross, but I want you to reflect on the passion of God towards you, the passion of God and his love towards you. And reflect upon that, and may that be the driving force that enables you to, to fulfill the promise that God has made in rescuing the souls of men through your life. Uh, May that be the purpose with which you live your life so that everything else that you do connects to that unchangeable purpose of God. May his passion drive you to do that. Let me pray for us this morning. Father, we thank you and we praise you, God, for this morning that you've given us to be in your presence. We thank you, God, that you give us the chance to look so back, way back in history and and look at these group of Jewish believers and read from the author and what he's telling them and and have that apply to our lives even today. What a privilege it is for us to be heirs of the promise that you made to Abraham so long ago. I pray that you would help us to consider just how meaningful it is for us to be the heirs of this amazing promise. Help us to be aware of this pro- the purpose with which you upheld this promise, this unchangeable purpose of saving the lost souls of men and women. And more than anything, Master, may we be mindful of the passion that you have for us, the passion that drove Jesus to the cross. May we not take that lightly. May we not just leave it for a moment that we ponder it during communion and then we forget about it, but may it be the consuming fire of our life that we would recognize and immerse ourselves in the amazing love, the amazing passion that you have for us through Jesus. May it be the foundation of everything that we do, every prayer that we pray, every word we speak, every action that we take. May our awareness of your undying passion for us be the root and the foundation of everything we do. Father, we thank you for the communion table before us. As we're about to partake of it, prepare our hearts, Lord. Father, we love you. We thank you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.